I'm Dr. Pete Nicholas. It's my pleasure today to have with us Father Raphael Barberg of St. James the Apostle Orthodox Church on Cranberry Road in Westminster, Maryland. Father, it's really good to have you here today. It's good to be here with you, Pete. So Father, uh, from what I gather, I know you are fairly new to Carroll County, so why don't you tell me how, how you came to come into this community? Well, I was assigned to uh, be the pastor here at St. James uh, Orthodox Church in uh, June of this past year after I graduated uh, from three years of seminary, St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary up in the New York City area. And so my family moved down here in June and uh, we've been happy to be a part of this community here ever since. Well, we welcome you and we hope that you're with us for many, many, many years until your beard becomes long and gray. <laughs> Grayer uh, than it because, is. Yeah. But anyway, um, t uh, you have a very, very interesting past as far as uh, priesthood is concerned. First of all, where are you from? I'm from the Buffalo, New York area. Uh, we, I was a policeman for 20 years in, uh, in uh, city of Buffalo, New York, and uh, felt the call that, uh, you know, perhaps we needed to follow the Lord in active ministry. I'd been a parish deacon for eight years, and uh, my wife uh, agreed with me and uh, followed through on this crazy idea of selling our, her dream home and packing up our then four kids and moving off to seminary in, in New York for those three years. And uh, uh, like I, as I said, we were sent here this past summer. Uh, um, is there anything at all that, that led you really to the call of priesthood? I mean can get into all kind of speculation because I, I'm sure that as a policeman, especially if I'm not mistaken, you were an officer, am I right? Yes, yeah, right. I, I was a patrol officer for uh, a number of years and uh, finished up my career as a lieutenant in a number of different uh, capacities. Um, and I've always, I always felt, my, felt my time as a police officer was a time of ministry. Uh, St. Paul says in his uh, book, to the, his epistle to the Romans, that... Um, to be careful, to be aware, and to obey the ruler because the ruler does not bear his sword in vain, but he is a minister of God for good. So I always felt that as, as the ruler of the city, the, the police officer, that that was a, a, a ministry from God, and I, and I took it very seriously. So I really feel like I've just moved from one sort of ministry to another. Um, as I said, at some point I, I had the privilege of serving as a deacon for eight years, which was, was a great blessing. Uh, I continued my work as a police officer, uh, earned my living that way. Uh, but in, in my time um, you know, away from the job and my time that my family uh, freed up for me, I was able to serve my home parish and serve my, uh, my, my pastor in the capacity of a deacon. And uh, I just felt that uh, perhaps you know, God wanted me to, to go on and, and uh, to do more. And, and as a police officer in New York State, I had the uh, uh, possibility of taking a pension after 20 years of service and so I um, again my wife agreed to do this and we uh, were able to um, follow through it's you know to have that many kids and to um, have an idea that God wants you to do something like this uh, it's just a blessing that um, you know we're, we've been able to do this okay well uh, I really uh, I welcome you here um, I just wanted to ask you too uh, were you raised in the in the Orthodox faith no uh, I was raised I was uh, brought up a Baptist from a long line of uh, Baptists down in, in the south and uh, um, you know through my youth we kind of uh, uh, bounced around checked out a few different uh, denominations and uh, uh, I had this idea that um, there was something wrong with the fact that there were so many different denominations to choose from that, you know, our consumeristic culture, um, you know, that you could just go shopping for a church. And of course, that's what, what I eventually did. But I thought there's something gravely wrong here when you read the book of Acts and you see that Christ established the church. And, you know, he, he gave these promises that, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and that he would send his Holy Spirit to the church to lead um, to lead it in all truth. And so I wondered, well, how do you know which, which church are you supposed to be a part of? And how do you, um, you know, uh, what is truth? How do you de determine? Um, I was told by many people to just, you know, you know to read the Bible and that, they, that God, would, uh, um, God would lead me through my reading of the Bible. But the problem is I came up with certain ideas from reading the Bible that other people didn't seem to share. Um, and that other people who claim to believe the Bible, I'll, you know, believe different things. So the whole question of, 
of, of authority and, and what the church is based on uh, began to be um, to, to rise in, in my uh, in my head. So I I kind of embarked on a on a little bit of a journey. I kind of stopped going to church altogether, and I don't recommend that. But that's kind of where I was at in my in my in my journey. I stayed home on Sunday mornings and prayed myself. But I, I in the meantime I, I read the scriptures. I read the New Testament. Um, and I began to study church history. I wanted to see, you know, I examined the church that I was a part of then and, and would go back, you know, followed it backwards to see where it came from. But at the same time, I also started studying the church in the book of Acts. And, well, what happened to those, the apostles? Where did they go? Where were the churches they started? And then, and then when I saw that, that they had been missionaries and had gone through the, the Roman Empire and, and elsewhere, I began to, um, to study uh, to see you know, what happened to that next generation of Christians? Or did they leave any writings? Did they leave any evidence of what life was like for them, how they worshiped God, how they believed? And so I kind of worked this way until I tried to find some, some common ground. And um, I had never heard of Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, or if I did, it was back in my, uh, my, you know, high school years studying church history. And I thought it was just, you know, another, you know, an Eastern form of Catholicism or something like that. And um, so... Uh, you know, in reading the, or about the early church, you can't miss studying about Eastern Orthodoxy. So uh, it was basically that, my study of the scriptures, my prayer to God, um, and my study of history that led me to this idea that the, the church that Christ established was, was alive and well, um, and that this church was the Eastern Orthodox Church. So having decided that, I had no choice but to, uh, to um, commit myself to that. Okay, um, a lot of our viewers may not know what, what Orthodox Christianity is, what the mm -hmm. Orthodox Church is, so I think it may be beneficial for us to go into that a bit. Um, can you uh, tell us, uh, tell us about the Orthodox Church itself? Um, what is the Orthodox Church when compared with other churches? Yeah, yeah and unfortunately you have to, uh, to, to describe where we're coming from, you have to compare to, to um, what else is there. Um, basically, the Orthodox Church is, is apostolic. Uh, we believe our origins are from the apostles themselves. Um, thus, we, we refer to ourselves, you know, we, for the public, we call ourselves the Eastern Orthodox Church, or we'll say we're Greek Orthodox, or Russian Orthodox, or Serbian Orthodox. All the, you know, all the same church, different ethnic groups expression of that church. But within ourselves, we talk about, and, and when we pray in, in, the, in, our, in, um, in our worship, we talk about the one holy Catholic apostolic church. One meaning that there is only one church, that there can't be two, three churches, or 26,000 churches, as uh, one uh, um, survey put. So it's, the church is one. Christ is the head of the church, and there's one church. The church is also holy, um, that there can be no... Uh, um, well, the church is set apart, that people are called out from the cultures that they're, they're from and, and set apart as holy unto God. The church is holy. The, the church is Catholic, Catholic in the small C sense, meaning uh, universal. Wherever you go, there's the church. It's the same church, um, you know, no matter where you go, no matter what time of history you pick out, there can only be one church. And, of course, as I said, it's apostolic. It has its roots from um, the apostles. And, um, you know, to talk about being Orthodox, normally, you know, when you encounter someone, you have to define it based upon, uh, you know, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, or else you have to talk about history. Um, the fact that for the first thousand years, there was basically one church, wherever you went in the Roman Empire and other places where Christianity had spread, you didn't go looking for the Orthodox Church, you didn't go looking for the Catholic Church, you didn't go looking for the Baptist Church. You said, where are the believers? Where is the church? Where can I find them and, and that I can worship with them? But unfortunately, after um, you know, thousands of years, the church split off, east and west. And then you know, the west uh, went on to have the Reformation, where you, you have this uh, um, fact of 26,000 some denominations now. So um, that's, that's basically what orthodoxy is. From our eyes, it's, it's the church that has maintained the, um, the traditions of the fathers, as handed down to us through, from the apostles. Um, it's the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Okay, very good. Thank you for that explanation. Um, when people have, uh, you know, some, you know, if they, they, they 
think of an Orthodox church or they've seen a movie perhaps like Dr. Zhivago or something <laughs> like that, you know, you see these, um, these figures, uh, these, these wooden paintings called icons and they kiss them, they cross themselves in front of them. And I think some people may have the, uh, the false interpretation that Orthodox worship or uh, Orthodox people worship icons. I'd like to get that clarified. Yeah, that, that's a good point. There, there are some misconceptions, um, and not just about iconography, but about, about a lot of things we do. Um, and, and since orthodoxy is so uh, rare and so new, basically, here to Carroll County, uh, the church that I'm the pastor of is the first, um, really the first orthodox church within our county, and it's the um, first English church in, you know, uh, all English church in the area. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions people really don't understand. And one thing that people think is, you know, they, they know that we use icons in our worship, such as, you know, this icon here of St. James or the, or the Lord or his mother here in the background. Um, but it's very important uh, to understand that icons are not um, anything we worship. We do not worship flesh and blood. We do not worship uh, wood and paint. We worship the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, but what icons are, icons for us are a symbol of the Incarnation. That uh, Christ, who is the eternal Word of God, uh, took on flesh for our salvation. Even though he was fully man, 100% fully God, 100% God, he took on flesh and became 100% man. And this great mystery that we, can, we can't understand. The icon is a, um, is a symbol of that, is a reminder of that, is a pointer towards that. Um, because Christ was a real human being in the flesh, um, you could, he could be depicted. People knew him when he walked down the street. There was, there's Jesus Christ. If they had had cameras in that day and age, they could have taken a picture. And this is a picture of, of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Um, but they didn't. What they did was have painting. And um, so we have continued the, the use of painting and other types of symbolism in our worship to point us to the very real fact that Christ has come in the flesh. The Word of God himself is incarnate as a man for our salvation. And so because we have icons, because of this insistence on the incarnation, we use these icons. You know, um, icons are used to tell a story, to help the, the icon behind us of, of the little baby being held in his mother's arm this is the reality of what we celebrate every year at the Nativity, the reality of what undergirds our whole uh, Orthodox worship. And so, uh, it, but it goes beyond there. Um, there were many, uh, you know, icons tell a story, but there, there's also icons of, of uh, individuals who are important to the Lord. For instance, you know, the St. James icon here in front of us. St. James um, was a brother of the Lord and that he was a close relation. Uh, the tradition tells us that he was uh, one of uh, Christ's stepfather Joseph's um, previous children. And he became an apostle and the first bishop of Jerusalem. So he was a very important person in the life of our Lord and in our Christian faith. So he is somebody that we um, have an icon of and which we name churches after such as our own. So, we, no, we, to make a, um, a uh, to give a short answer to uh, the question, we don't worship icons, but we do use them in our worship. They help point us to God. Okay, very good. Thank you very, very much for, for uh, clarifying that for some of our viewers. Um, if you were to say, for example, as a matter of fact, just as a point of clarification, there was an ecumenical council that clarified the issue on icons. Am I right? That's so important. Um, Everything in the church from the very beginning, as we read in the book of Acts, was settled. You know, controversies came up. Whether a new Christian had to become a Jew, and, and for an adult that meant, you know, for an adult male that meant circumcision. And, and the, the church came together into a council and decided that no, that, that to become a Christian did not mean that you had to become, become a Jew and accept circumcision. And that, that pattern followed on through church history, that any major decision that came up the church gathered together in council. Another great example of that is the, is the Council of Nicaea, which, which came together um, as a result of the, the, the teachers of a certain uh, priest out of uh, Alexandria called Arius, who tried to say that Christ, there was a time that Christ was not, that he was a creature 
like the rest of us, that he was not the eternal word of God. And so the Nicene Council came together and um, came up with the Nicene Creed to combat um, this false teaching of Arius. Well, the same thing is true about controversies over, over icons. Um, people today aren't the first to, to accuse us Orthodox of, of worshiping icons, and there arose a movement within the church to try to say that this was not right, this was idol worship, this was not of God. So once again, the church came together in the, in the, the, uh, in the city of Nicaea again, once again and determined once and for all that, no, we use icons in our worship, that this is indeed wooden paint, and that if you take a cross and you break it in half, you you throw it in the fire, it's simply wood, it burns. But when two pieces of wood are put together in the form of the cross, that points us to the Lord. When an artist takes a, a, a board and paint and paints um, you know, a, a depiction of, of the Lord or of a saint or an event in the history of our salvation, that this is an icon, this is something holy that points us to God. So it's not just something that we've taken lightly, it's something that's been hammered out over the course of 2,000 years and that we who live in this day and age don't have to continue to invent uh, Christianity over and over again, but it's something that's been present with us for 2,000 years. Okay. Um, can I ask you, I'll, I'll try and point maybe just a couple of things to you uh, for our viewers to find out what may, some of the differences may be between some of our, you know, our, our, our other sister Christian churches in the, you know, throughout the world. For example, um, what separates, what separates basically the Orthodox Church from the Catholic Church? Yeah, that, that's a good and important question. And in fact, as I mentioned, you know, for the first thousand years, there was one church. Um, and, and the Bishop of Rome was one of the most important bishops, if not the most important bishop in, in the church. Um, he was referred to as the... Uh, Primus inter Paris, the first among equals, the um, chairman of the bishops when they came together in these councils. Um, but what ended up separating us was the exact, his exact role in the church. In the West, uh, he began to see, be seen as the, um, the father of all of the church. Whereas in the East, we always had maintained to know it's Christ is the head of the church. And any major decisions here on earth is when the bishops come together, and the belief is that you know that Christ, when two or three are gathered, Christ is there in the midst, and that that that's where we hammer things out. So that is our, you know the one big dis distinction between us and the Roman Catholics is we do not have you know a pope or a pope figure. Um, there's other issues. You know uh, the big issue that came up was was the use of the creed, and in addition to the creed, that was not decided um, upon by the the councils. Um, and then, there, then, of course, because we've been separated for all these years, there's been other differences that have arisen in time. But, you know, um, you know God willing, you know, the, these uh, schisms in the churches will be healed. God wants us all to be unified. Christ wants his body to be unified. And so we pray for, for reunification of, of the Christian churches. But we, um, we're pretty staunch. We, we're not about to give ground on things that we believe have been handed down from the apostles. Um, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but in some of my study uh, of the Orthodox Church, um, and correct me or, or guide me if I'm wrong, but uh, basically the dogma of the Orthodox Church, to be an Orthodox Christian is basically to believe in the creed. Am I correct? That's, that's, uh, th th there's, there's two aspects of it. It's that we have right belief, and that's what orthodoxy means. Ortho, you know, you're, you're a dentist, and uh, everybody uh, with, with kids is always worried about the ortho, orthodontist having to pay to have their kid teeth straightened, their kids' teeth straightened, and that's, that's what ortho means, straight, the, the true, um, not deviating. And doxa, sometimes being um, referred to as doxology, being glory, the right glory, but also the right, you know, doxa doctrine. The, the right doctrine, the true doctrine. So believing in the, the faith as taught by Christ and the apostles and handed down to us is, is something key for an Orthodox Christian. But it can't be just what we believe. There has to be a, a unity there because if you believe this and you're over there and I believe this and I'm over here, what, what, what does that mean? What's important for us Orthodox is that we are united and we are united in the body and blood of Christ. Christ said, as often as you eat and drink this and do this in remembrance of me, that he is there in our midst. And this is what unifies us as, as Christians when we partake of the Lord's body and blood together. So it's, 
It's believing the right things, of course, but also being in union, being in communion with each other. Okay. Uh, as far as the, uh, the uh, Orthodox, uh, the communion, okay, the Eucharist is concerned. Uh, in Orthodoxy, as I believe it is in the Catholic Church, and I believe in the Episcopal Church, am I right? We do believe in transubstantiation, is that right? Well, transubstantiation is a problematic word because it's not a word that we've ever used in our Orthodox teaching. Um, it was, uh, you know, a, a word that came about in discussions in, in the West um, about, um, you know, is this the body and blood of the, of the Lord or is it just a, a symbol, you know, in a, in a way that maybe an icon is just pointing to, the, pointing to something real. Um, so I would say that there, there are some commonalities in that we believe that this is truly his precious body and that this is truly his precious blood. Um, but we are a little hesitant to get into um, um, defining and uh, uh, overanalyzing. We just simply know it's a mystery. We believe it's the Lord's body and blood because he said so. And that's it. We don't have to get into any more of when, exactly when it happens or how it happens or anything of that nature. So we're really hesitant to, um, so I, I wouldn't say that transubstantiation is a, as a word um, um, conveys what we Orthodox believe, but um, there, I think there is a commonality between um, you know, Roman Catholics and um, you know, very traditional Protestants who have maintained the tradition that when, when the community gathers on a Sunday or, or on any other special occasion that you are actually parta par participating or taking in the Lord's body and blood because he said it was. It's, it's, not, it's not bread and wine anymore. Well, I would say just as Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, um, the same thing is true of, of our communion, that it, you know, if we took the, took the elements to a chemist and he you know, divides them down to their, their most basic elements, that sure enough, it's bread, sure enough, it's wine. But for us Christians who believe and participate, it is the body and blood of Christ. And that's as far as we're willing to go. Okay. It's a matter of faith. Um, can you tell me some of the uh, Orthodox traditions? In other words, uh, one of the things that happens periodically is, uh, uh, I believe perhaps maybe once every four years, the Western and the Eastern dates for, for, uh, for Pascha for Easter come together. And uh, I don't know how these calendars came about or whatever, and not that it makes much difference, mm. but you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, one thing that um, if you have a neighbor or you know somebody who's Orthodox, one thing that you might pick up right away is uh, the celebration of some major events in the life of Christians are, are uh, on, according to different date of reckoning. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, in, in most Western Orthodox Christians have revised our calendar so that we are in line with Western churches in our celebrations of, of Christmas, the Nativity of Christ, and of um, you know, some of the other fixed dates. Um, but back in, you know, overseas and some, some Orthodox in this country, you know, have continued to use an older reckoning, the, the Julian calendar, as opposed to the newer Gregorian calendar, um, for that. But the one thing that almost across the board, and there's, of course, always an exception, but almost across the board, all Orthodox celebrate the great feast of the resurrection together on the, on the same day of Pascha. Um, and it's a different type of reckoning that we use, which uh, would take more than a half hour program to talk about. Uh, but basically, uh, it has to do with when, um, you know, um, the, uh, the new moon after the, the, uh, after the uh, vernal equinox occurs, um, and according to which calendar you're reckoning that. So us Orthodox, sometimes our, our Paschal celebration, and, and Pascha being, uh, you know, the word that we use for, for our, our Feast of the Resurrection, known in English as Easter, um, sometimes we fall on the same day, and other years it falls maybe a week apart, and then some years it falls a month apart. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, the same celebration of the resurrection of Christ that, is, that has li literally changed the world is what we are participating in. Okay. Um, other things uh, in, uh, in Orthodoxy, um, yeah, for example, explain some of the, you know, other major feast days that, uh, that are in the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church has a, has a uh, great emphasis on, on fasting, which, um, you know, as we all approach the, uh, the, the dates of Great Lent, you know, Ash Wednesday is right here upon us for the Christians in the West, and shortly thereafter, we, we Eastern Orthodox will begin 
fasting for Lent. And that, that's about half the year. But as, as we fast, it's always with the goal in mind of, of feasting. Um, that our faith is very celebratory. We celebrate the great works that Christ has done for our salvation. And so along with the feast of, of Christmas, the, the nativity, and the, the feast of the resurrection of Christ, which most Christians, are, you know, of, of whatever stripe, celebrate, we also have a very full liturgical calendar and, and such events as, um, there's, there's, other than the Feast of Pascha, where there's 12 great feasts that we celebrate at all, you know, all together, and then very many more minor um, celebrations. And um, depending on where you are, um, you know, take on either a major role or, or sometimes overlooked. But the, the 12 great feasts center on the events in the life of our Lord and his mother, the Theotokos, um, such as the Feast of the Transfiguration, of Christ on the Mount, Mount Tabor, which we celebrate every year in, in, past, in, in the month of August, the Feast of the, the Entry into Jerusalem, sometimes known as Palm Sunday, um, that many people know about, we, is always celebrated on the Sunday before uh, the Great Pascha itself. Um, and then, of course, uh, events in the life of, of his mother, such as, as, as the, the time when the Archangel Gabriel came and announced to her um, that uh, she was to, to conceive and bear a son, um, you know, the Savior of the world, which we celebrate on March 25th, of the Feast of the Annunciation. So we have a very full cycle of, of not just fasting, which a lot of people hear about, um, but, also, but also feasting. It's a, a great deal of celebration, which in every Orthodox culture takes on a different flavor, and, and there's different foods associated, and, and dance, and drink, and, and just celebrating the fact that um, our Lord has come in the flesh to save us. Father, I thank you very, very much. Time is getting short here, and uh, I'm sure that some of our viewers who've enjoyed your presence uh, would look forward to perhaps another show, mm. and I would maybe ask you to do that. And the other thing I would ask is, if anyone had any questions or anything like that, uh, would you mind if we gave them uh, at the end of the show on the screen, perhaps guidelines to the website or where, where St. James uh, the Apostle Church is, how to get in touch with you, would that be okay? Absolutely. Um, uh, my uh, primate here in North America of our, of our Antiochian Orthodox Church, which I'm a part of, is uh, Metropolitan Philip, and he's said that Orthodoxy is the best kept secret in America. And so, of course, you know, we're trying to, to do what we can to, to let people know more about the Orthodox faith, and I'm more than happy to um, uh, field any uh, emails or, or calls if anybody would like to learn more. Father, thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, I want to thank everyone for viewing this, and I hope, uh, I hope it's, it's been a benefit. And Father, thanks a lot. Thank you, Pete.